Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Aguipe. I am a PhD candidate uh, at USC in the Nidarian Evolutionary Ecology Lab. And what you see in front of you is a picture of one of the stars of this talk, which is an anemone, uh, specifically Aptasia pallida. Uh, in this picture, you see no dyes. Uh, every color you see is real with some slight modifications. Uh, the magenta dots are little tiny dinoflagellate algae that live inside anemones and corals, and they produce all the energy uh, for these organisms. And the yellow ones are unidentified microorganisms, so you don't know who they are. And then this group here is the mouse, so that's the anemone mouse. And it seems like it's eating some of its own symbiotes as well. Uh, but today, I'm going to tell you all about one of my PhD side projects, which came by accidentally, and I've taken great pleasure in, in, in doing it. But before I tell you about it, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on my research so you know why, why we, we did this. So I've been studying anemone algal bacterial interactions for about past four and a half years uh, to learn more about corals and bacteria and algae. We use the anemone Aptasia pallida, which is this big uh, chunky, chunky anemone uh, that you see here uh, because it's a rising model organism. And the specific strain of Aptasia pallida that we use is the little smaller skinnier strain CC7. But um, we use anemones because we are trying to uh, understand Nidarian bacterial algal interactions, but it's kind of hard to do that with corals because attempting to rid corals of their algae, which are the same algae that um, live with anemones, and you can see them here, and this is what they look like inside coral and anemone tentacles as well. Um, if you try to get uh, rid of these algae and corals, you will end up killing them. Sony corals, uh, in particular, you'll end up killing them uh, because they can't survive without their algal partners for, for too long, as they are um, the main source of energy uh, out, out there in the reefs. And um, so that's why we use Aptasia, because they're very closely related to corals. So think of Aptasia as a cousin to the stony coral. And their polyps, um, as you can see here, right, the polyps, they morphologically, over here is, is a better example, they, they resemble corals. Let me see. Okay, cool. Um, and the only difference between them is that corals have this calcium carbonate skeleton on the outside of the polyp and anemones obviously you know they don't have that skeleton they're soft mushy, and also very very feisty so to understand this biosis for the expulsion of all the symbionts um we use aptasia in the lab basically we can keep them in symbiotic or aposymbiotic state. And aposymbiotic state is basically um, no algal symbiont. They can reproduce sexually or asexually. And this allows us to conduct clono experiments, which facilitate reproducibility in any lab around the world. In addition to that, they are very, very easy to manipulate, um, and they're almost impossible to kill. If you kill an anemone, uh, you've got to really work on your husbandry skills because they're really difficult to kill. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, amateur aquarists um, consider them pests and have a very hard time getting rid of them. In addition to this, um, these anemones have been widely studied as of lately, and there's a range of molecular information on them, uh, phys physiological information, there's proteome databases, and um, there's a lot of information about uh, the Nidarian algal symbiosis um, with them as well. And in addition to that, many of the same microbes that associate with corals also associate with aptasia, and perhaps even fungi. So initially, 
we were interested in investigating natural products made by these bacteria that live with anemones and their symbiotic algae. Uh, natural products, for some of you that are not familiar with these, um, are biologically active products that are produced by living organisms. Uh, this can be anything from wood to urine to antimicrobials. So we were interested in a subset of these products uh, labeled secondary metabolites, which are produced for survival, defense, and fitness of a population. They are usually secreted out of the cells but they're not essential for individual cellular function, which is why they're usually produced in very, very tiny amounts. So some secondary metabolites you may already be familiar with are penicillin, uh, medicinal compounds like Botox and toxins like tetrodotoxin, psychedelics, um, and also chemicals from plants we find in foods like vanillin, and also resveratrol from fermented grapes, also known as wine. And a lot of people take pleasure in consuming THC and CBD. So at this point, yes, we went on a hunting expedition. And to do this, we had to isolate and culture these uh, anemone bacteria and harvest their waste or, you know, think of it as poop. Uh, we collaborated with a lab that specializes in isolating these natural products or secondary metabolites, um, but they specialize in fungi. They agreed to run some of our bacteria poop through one of their fancy chemical compound separating instruments um, called an LCMS or liquid uh, chromatography mass spectral spectrometry. However, we ran into a problem with our bacteria, and the problem is that their biomass is so small and they're producing these tiny minute amounts of metabolites. So this metabolite might be very potent, but scaling up would be time intensive and use up just too many resources. So one day I'd grown liters and liters of bacteria. I filtered their I filtered their cells out and just kept their waste. And I brought it over to our collaborators lab. And Chris Rabbit, who was a PhD student at the time, and he just got his PhD recently. Um, he was able to detect various compounds on the LCMS, but the quantity was so low that we would have to grow and process liters upon liters of this bacteria poop to get enough product to analyze um, using other methods like crystallography um, to determine the exact composition and elemental structure of this compound. So admittedly, Chris was very frustrated from this. And after months and months of scale, or trying to scale up and it never being enough, um, Chris said to me this, this, this famous question, don't you have some fungi you can bring me instead? And I thought about it and I told them, well, give me some media and I'll see what I can do. And that's how we ended up pursuing this anemone fungal project. But um, so before I continue and tell you more about the project, I want to give you a quick crash course on fungi. Um, they are a eukaryotic cell, which means that they have a clear nucleus that contains all of its DNA, and they can be either asexual or sexual, and can be either single-celled, as you see here, or they can obtain a multi, a more complex multicellular form uh, from just one cell where they produce fruiting bodies, which are then usually desiccated into spores and are dispersed throughout their environment. They are distinct from other kingdoms of life in the fact that they actually excrete digestive enzymes outside of, of their cells and they eat their prey by essentially dissolving them outside of the cell wall. Um, there are exceptions to this, of course. There's the parasitic fungi, which obviously eat you from the inside out, but um, that is really the hallmark of fungi. So a while back, they had been classified as a subcategory of plants up until probably the latter half of the 20th century, when DNA sequencing revealed that they were more closely related to us than to plants. 
Um, so, however, they have evolved their own like unique way of being multicellular, and they actually don't share any sequences like those that direct multicellularity in animals or plants. So they stand on their own. And um, yeah, and over here is a schematic where you have the whole timeline of life. We have the Big Bang 14 billion years ago, about 4.5, the Earth was formed, 3.8, you start seeing these prokaryotes, you start seeing your bacteria, your archaea, and then you start seeing eukaryotes around 2 billion years ago, cyanobacteria happens, um, and then you have the protists that come up around 1.5, and then somewhere in between these, the, the time that protists came up, uh, to plants, fungi appeared, and I was kind of um, kind of sad that they didn't show them in the schematic. But here is the tree of life, and in this tree of life, you see the three main branches of of life. Right, you have archaea, you have bacteria, and you have eukaryotes. Well, um, you see the green plants are here. And then you have all these other critters here, and then just a different, so many other critters there. Well, if you zoom in to this metazoan part, you find that fungi are actually close, more closely related to us. See, we're here, fungi are here, than plants are. Plants are right here. So that's something to think about. Um, and I didn't know that prior to this. So um, we are familiar with, with fungi because of their terrestrial roles, right? Um, there's production where we have observed fungi as lichens, which is the symbiotic association between um, fungi, algae, and bacteria. And this usually is involved in primary production in terrestrial systems where fungi nutritionally and structurally support these photosynthetic active algae and bacteria as well. And also we see them in mycorrhizal networks with plants. Uh, we're familiar with them because they regulate the ecosystem. So they can act as parasites to harmful pests and protect important members of um, these ecosystems. In terms of provisioning, we're familiar with them because they provide us with food. Uh, we've known them for thousands of years and we've used them as medicine. Uh, you can see this in traditional uh, Chinese medicine even today. And of course, um, We've, we've used uh, fungi to create um, alcoholic beverages um, using using yeast, right? Like Saccharomyces cerevisiae. There's, uh, there's cultural relevance to fungi where we've gained cognitive benefits from consuming them, psychotropics in moderate amounts. Um, and they previously uh, served in Buddhist, Aztec, and Mayan religious rituals. And they have symbolism in Norse myth mythology as well. Um, in particular, this this critter here, uh, this red fungi, it's Amanita muscaria. So yes, we are deeply connected to fungi here on Earth, but they're also out in the marine environment. And a lot of people don't know that marine fungi exist. And in the marine uh, environment, they continue to play a role as the creators of organic matter and they infect organisms, they regulate harmful organisms like diatoms that produce neurotoxins, as is the case of chytrids. You see these chytrids schematics here. Um, infecting uh, this harmful algal bloom uh, called Pseudonychia. So uh, Pseudonychia uh, produces demoic acid, which causes amnesic uh, shellfish, shellfish poisoning in humans and can also lead to short-term memory loss, coma, and death. So um, it's believed that fungal parasites of this diatom regulate algal blooms by infecting the host and then uh, killing them. So despite these clear e ecosystem benefits of fungi and the environment, we still don't know very much about them. We, we know very little about them compared to bacteria, plants, and animals. We focus a lot of our research efforts in this past 20th century, 21st century, um, on, on these other organisms. And they do remain the most understudied major branch of the evolutionary tree of life. So, in fact, fungal biodiversity is so vast and much of it remains undiscovered 
um, that I decided to include this QR code. And by the way, you will be seeing a lot of QR codes throughout my presentation. Um, but yeah, I decided to include this, this code here so you can check it out, Britannica's um, fungi classification. You'll see that there is about 67 phyla, 10 subphyla, 35 classes, 12 subclasses, 129 orders, and countless families genera and species and, and strains. There's so many of them. And in fact, the ones that we are the most familiar with, mushrooms, they only exist under one of these phyla. So it's just knowing this, when, when I was doing some research on this, it just blew my mind. But before I continue, let's address the elephant in the room. When I say fungi, most folks will automatically associate this word with mushrooms, the fruiting bodies of a phylum of fungi, so Basidiomycota. It does make sense, after all, uh, they're probably the most charismatic members of the fungi kingdom. I mean, look at these guys, they're so cute. Uh, they are visually stunning, uh, they provide us with food, so these would probably be um, edible, edible mushrooms. Not psychedelic, but edible. Um, they have medicinal benefits, and of course, they give us out of this world experiences. Uh, here are some mushrooms I found last month after the rains in Elysian Park. And if you want to know more about their taxonomy, you can go ahead and follow me on M. Aggie. Uh, my, my username is M. Aggie on iNaturalist um, to find out more about where they stand in terms of taxonomy. But anyway, mushrooms like these only make up about 20,000 of the species in the fungal kingdom. And all of them are pretty much terrestrial, except for one recently discovered aquatic mushroom. So we know that there are possible, possibly millions of species within the fungi umbrella. Most of them actually don't look like mushrooms. And many of them are unclassified and we know nothing about them. So we know that we don't know anything. <laughs> and most fungal biodiversity is microscopic and unseen. And you'll, you'll both in terrestrial systems and marine systems. In fact, true fungal biodiversity looks more like this and beyond. Many of these uncharismatic fungi, they associate or live in mutualisms uh, and parasitic relationships with animals, other microbial eukaryotes, and as discussed uh, before, plants. So today I'm going to focus on the close association between one of these guys and my favorite animals that we discussed earlier, the anemones, Aptasia pallida. So currently there are no studies exploring fungi in Aptasia, but there are several studies investigating fungi in other anemones and corals. Um, for example, there's this, there's this study here that looked at the anemone at the Pleura santogramica, which is found along the coast of Southern California, you can actually see it um, in San Pedro and Catalina Island. And this study yielded 32 distinct fungal isolates of 15 different families, and more than half of these isolates displayed antimicrobial activity. This other study on this other anemone yielded five isolates, and one strain showed anti, uh, strong antimicrobial activities. So um, we know that there has been plenty of studies on coral reef associated fungi and um, they're very strong, novel secondary metabolite profiles, but most of these studies are, are conducted under the chemistry biotech approach, right? The ecological role of fungi in, Cnidarian, um, in the Cnidarian animal is currently unknown and um, it's going to be hard to figure out what it is because, as I said before, um, it's really hard to experimentally um, test these things on corals in a controlled environment. But in contrast, we can experimentally infect notobiotic or those that have been cleaned of viruses, protists, bacteria, algae, and other fungi. Um, Anemones. So we can we can test this out on either symbiotic, so uh, anemones that have their algae with them, or aposymbiotic anemones, anemones that have been um, cleaned out of their algae, and then uh, go ahead and test that out with some fungal isolates and observe the progress of their relationship. And then we can go ahead and collect genomic 
metabolic and chemical data, um, which we can easily trace back to its biological origin without, you know, that whole bacterial, viral, and persistent noise. Um, but first, before we do any of that, we have to find out who who associates with aptasia first, right? Which type of fungi associates with aptasia, attempt to isolate them and identify them. So um, in order to, to do that, that meant that we had to start with an aptasia anemone that still had all of its native microbes in it. And so now I'm gonna return back to the question, right? Don't you have some fungi you can bring me? So Chris gave me some media and I dug into the literature, added some of my own tricks to the literature. And the first thing I did was I starved this big anemone and to us a big anemone is like, it's big. Um, might not be big to you, but to us that's, that's that's a pretty big anemone. So I starved it for two weeks to make sure that it was rid of all its prey. And then um, I went ahead and rinsed it in filtered seawater three times and then dipped it in 70% ethanol twice. And admittedly, it didn't like that. Um, it, it shriveled up. But the reason I did that was to um, get rid of whatever microbes were on the surface of this anemone. And then I rinsed it with filter seawater three more times and then placed this anemone in a two mil uh, micro centrifuge tube that contained uh, silica zirconia beads. And then I went ahead and placed that tube in a bead beater, which um, really beats the hell out of that tube. And what ends up happening at this point is you get the slurry. So the anemone obviously is gonna die and you get the slurry, but it beats the anemone to the point of death, but not to the point of death of smaller organisms like fungi and bacteria and algae as well. So I took the slurry, I diluted it um, one up to one to 1000. And then I plated it on potato dextrous agar, which is a famous general media for um, growing fungi. And then I waited five days and then I waited and waited. And then when I finally saw something that grew, um, I went and picked single isolates and placed them in new plates. And this is what we got. We got a CC7 yellow. Again, CC7 is for our Aptasia strain, CC7 yellow, CC7 dark. We still didn't know who these guys were. So um, to figure out who they were, um, we had to go ahead and sequence um, the in internal transcriber sequence uh, gene. Um, it's this gene that tells us um, the identity of different eukaryotes. And we went ahead and sequenced ITS1, so the first part of the gene, and ITS4, um, some, sometime, somewhere in the middle. And after sequencing them and finding out who they were, penicillium species and cladosporium, we went ahead and proceeded with our um, secondary metabolite analysis. And so the first thing we did was extract this agar uh, with methanol and ethyl acetate, as you can see here. And just from looking at it, you can tell that the yellow one had more stuff in it than, than the dark one. We went ahead and filtered all this cell cellular junk, uh, proteins, carbs, and just other things that we didn't need until we had these, these clear liquids. And then uh, we used this device, a rotary evaporator, which uses pressure and um, heat to dry these liquids here. And um, it dried them to a powder and then we resuspended this powder in methanol and then we ran it on the LCMS. So um, I'll ask you to ignore these, these two, <laughs> these two pr profiles here and just focus on this one. But um, with LCMS, a liquid is passed through the column um, you place your sample in. And in this column, compounds are separated by their hydrophobic interactions, or that is the, the compatibility with water or ion exchange. So the more compatible your compounds are with water, 
um, the more or the more soluble your compounds are, uh, they'll appear early on in the plot uh, than those that are not hydrophobic. That I'm sorry, that are more hydrophobic. So the time that it takes them to pass through the column is called the retention time. And this is what you'll see here on the x-axis. The MS part or the mass spectrophotometer part of this analysis uses the mass to charge ratio of the particles to identify the molecules that make up this compound. And then it goes ahead and creates the signal, which is visualized as distinct peaks you can see here. And this is the y-axis and this is what you'll see as absorbance units or um, AU, sorry, pointer. It's going crazy, AU. Okay, so different compounds have distinct retention times, but sometimes retention, retention times can overlap within compounds, which makes it difficult to fully characterize the actual structure of these compounds by just looking at this um, chromatogram or this graph. Um, especially, and that's the case, especially when you have something like this, when you have so many compounds coming, coming at you at once. So when this happens and with novel compounds that you, what you think it might be a novel compound, you need to use multiple approaches um, to determine the molecular, molecular structure of these compounds, which includes um, other methods like crystallography and, and a high resolution LCMS. However, um, from this spectra, Chris, the, the person that ran the LCMS, concluded that it could be that this here, we, we didn't know who all the, you know, what compounds make up all these peaks, but he, he could tell that this, these peaks here, the most abundant ones, um, were more than likely Hanamindol or Citroindol. And these compounds have been known to um, have activity against worms. And so what happens is that it's basically the same compound and the only difference that it has is this OH group. So when it has this OH group, it's henamindol. And when it has the, when it doesn't have the, the oxygen, it's just um, citroindol. And it goes back and forth depending on, on you know, the, what, what liquid it's in and, and other, other things as well. But after some analysis, he couldn't confirm that this was the exact chemical structure of this compound, so we decided to move on and let him give him some time to figure that out. And meanwhile, we decided to break up that extract into three different fractions and dry them to a powder, and this is how we separated them. So if you remember what I said about retention times and hydrophobicity, um, you'll remember that this is probably more, a bunch of more polar compounds, and then this is the probable citroindole and henamindole, we don't know. And then this here is probably more complex hydrophobic compounds. Okay, so... We sent these dried fractions to our collaborator over in Florida, uh, Dr. Corey Credit, um, so that he can go ahead and test each one of these dried fractions against uh, coral and human pathogens. And our main question here is to find out, will there be any activity against these pathogens? And if so, then maybe we, we can put in more effort to actually separating these compounds into their individual, um, these fractions into their individual compounds. But right now we're just trying to figure out if there's even any activity at all. So in addition to that, um, we were also curious to know if this penicillium, so we at this point we're just focusing on the yellow one, penicillium, um, along with other fungi though, uh, were also present in natural environmental samples. So I think when you're working in the lab and you've had a lab strain for so long, there is the possibility of um, finding critters that might just be an anomaly to your own lab samples. And we wanted to discount that possibility, right? Because there's no point in, in investigating this fungi if it's only something that we would see in our lab. We, we want to see this out in the field as well. So um, luckily for us, one of Carly's students or my advisor, Dr. Carly Kinkle, um, one of her students had went off to Florida 
and um, have collected a bunch of Aptasia, uh, natural Aptasia from Florida for a separate project and she happened to have extras. So Carly, my advisor, took it upon herself and extracted DNA and sequenced that um, ITS gene I mentioned earlier um, from these anemone samples. So she did uh, meta barcoding of this gene. And um, yeah, they originated from mangrove and dock sites along the Florida coast. Um, yeah, and so one thing is that the databases for fungal identification are not nearly as curated or comprehensive as those um, for bacteria. So um, we've, we did find that many of the sequence reads that came back to us after sequencing, um, they didn't map back to anything. Uh, this is still usable data, but in order to accurately identify fungal species, uh, my advisor would have to would have to blast each one um, individually. Uh, so she decided to take the most abundant sequences and blast them against a better curated fungal database called Unite. And lo and behold, <laughs> the top hits matched to penicillium species, and it wasn't just one one species; it was uh, a bunch of them. Um, so let me explain this plot to you. You see on the y-axis, we have this ASV with a different number. And then on the x-axis, we have these different sites, this uh, environmental sites that these anemones came from. ASV stands for Amplicon Sequencing Variant, and it is a unique DNA sequence accurate to single base pairs of this ITS gene. But it can be any gene. Um, in our case, it's ITS. In this case, um, the sequence that makes up ASV1, as you can see here, is very prominent in a lot of the samples from different places. Um, and we see that different places have, are more prominent in certain ASVs than others. So this suggests that they are consistently associated with Aptasia anemones, but we're not sure what their functional role is. And um, it's a question, it's definitely a good question to ask. Uh, because here's the thing, Aptasia are not passive creatures. Um, they can be very territorial. I've, another name for Aptasia is the solitary anemone. They're very territorial and they don't hesitate to put stinging cells to use. And when they sting, they inject venom. So to us, uh, we're interested in finding out, well, how did, if, if we see penicillium in all these samples, how did they find a way to circumvent this, you know, the defense system of anemones? Because um, what's going on here, what type of interaction is happening here? Because we can see how bacteria can get away with it, but fungi are a little bit bigger than bacteria. So that's a very interesting question. And certainly, you know, the field can benefit from more of these meta barcoding sequencing surveys, um, fungal isolations, and other experiments um, to help us answer these questions. So, in conclusion, um, we are currently working on the fungal ecology paper. We would like to put it out maybe in a few months. Um, what we have so far is um, we were able to sequence the genome, assemble it, and annotate it with the help of our collaborators over at UC Riverside, Jason and Mark. Um, they went ahead and built the hybrid assembly for us, annotated the genome, and did a full phy phylogenetic analysis to determine what species was penicillium rubens, we found out, which, by the way, was the first um, fungi to produce penicillium. And um, yeah. So uh, yeah, and then here is a QR code to our genome if you want to go check it out. The environmental survey data analysis that I talked about that my advisor uh, conducted, it's still ongoing. She's almost done with it. And then um, our collaborator, Dr. Corey Credit, is working on the antimicrobial and swarming assays as well. So fungal ecology, why does it matter? I hope we convinced you, I convinced you today that marine fungi are under research in general and researching them more could play a role in the health of Nigerian animals and could provide us with more novel secondary metabolites, right? Uh, lastly, I do want to leave you with this image. Um, these are about, 
This, these are a fraction of what lives inside of a sponge. And there's about 40 different strains in there. You look at the colors, you look at the pigments, the morphological shapes, they're all very different. They're quite diverse. And um, just by looking at this, you can tell there's probably unknown natural products being produced here. And um, we just don't know what they are. You might have in, in, in here, just in here, these 40 here, um, you might have your next antimicrobial, your next anti-cancer compound, maybe even a psychedelic <laughs> or, or a pain reliever. Who knows? Um, until this, this is research, we, we're not going to know that. And um, I'd like to close with my acknowledgments. Um, I'd like to thank everybody in my lab, the Niderian Evolutionary Ecology Lab, um, this is my funding source, NSF, uh, Maria for the anemone samples, my advisor, Carly, um, collaborator in Florida, Dr. Corey Credit, a newly minted PhD, Dr. Chris Rabbit, um, his advisor, Clay Wang, and our UC Riverside collaborators, Jason and Mark. And with that, if anybody has any questions, I'll take them now. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, I want to make sure uh, everyone gets a chance to ask you about stuff. I think everyone uh, uh, taking uh, pictures of your uh, hero kids right now. Uh, so let's go ahead. Hi, Emily. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is great. I learned about some marine fungi. So I wanted to ask about, um, do we know anything about the uh, way that uh, uh, the way that mutualism evolved uh, between fungus and, and cnidarians because uh, for plants I know that they're, they're the examples of mycorrhizae look like they're an invasion event you know as a parasite might do and then they've you know obviously been switched to a mutualistic role is there evidence for something like that here I'm not sure about um, parasitic fungi I think they they have been documented in the coral literature before I do know that that uh, other types of fungi that have been documented um, in corals, not necessarily anemones, but in corals have been uh, fungi that live in um, in the skeleton. So there, there is a record of fungi that live in the skeleton. Again, we don't really know why or how. Um, it's very understudied in that field. Thank you. Uh, Josh, you had a question? Nope, sorry, just playing your buttons. Yo, sorry. Yo, sorry. Uh, I was playing with the buttons in the recording. I uh, wanted to make sure everything was still working. Sorry about that. Oh, we do have a oh, question. Do have a question? Oh. We have a question from the room. Jay, um, have you thought about what biodiversity of the fungal populations will be given the current like global warming trends? Or is it increasing or decreasing? Um, no, I haven't thought about that, but just from what I know, um, I would, I would think that perhaps it would be increasing, um, but that's just my, my whim. I can tell you a funny story, uh, about this penicillium though. When a, a few months ago, we had a big anemone die off. So I think, I don't know if you remember, I said it's really hard to kill anemones, but in our lab, in the incubator, the incubator went up to 40, 42 degrees Celsius. That's really high. Um, and they all died. All the anemones died. And the only fungi that survived was the penicillium one, the one that I just talked about right now. So um, I think I think they're going to be survivors. And I, I think that we're probably going to see them come up with global warming, but that's just my hunch. I don't have any any actual evidence for that. <laughs> cool, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, great. Thank you, Emily. Yay. Thank you, everybody, for attending my talk. <laughs>